So I know a few of you are still getting lunch, but uh, we have a number of people online. Our speaker has garnered significant, significant interest among our friends and colleagues and students who can't be here in person, but are joining us on Zoom. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Joe Aldi, a faculty member here at the Harvard Kennedy School and the host of the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. Uh, as a reminder, we are doing this in hybrid format. Uh, so we have a full room, standing room only here at the Kennedy School, as well as having our friends joining us online. We're thrilled to have with us today, Leah Stokes for her talk, Making Climate Policy, Why the Inflation Reduction Act Passed. Leah is the Anton Vonk Associate Professor of Environmental Politics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's visiting the Radcliffe Institute this year as the Jeffrey S. and Margaret Mace Padnos Fellow. Apologies for mispronouncing that there. Uh, she focuses her research on climate policy and politics. Some of you may recall, uh, she joined us in the seminar during the pandemic via Zoom uh, to talk about her then recently published book, Short Circuiting Policy, which examined why we're behind on climate action and addressing the history of electric utilities uh, promoting climate denial and delay. It was named the best energy book of 2020 by the American Energy Society and listed as a top five climate book in 2020 by the New York Times. Uh, I would also note that because of her engaged scholarship, she's become quite influential in many policy debates and has been recognized on the 2022 Time 100 Next list and the Business Insider Climate Action 30 list. So we're uh, thrilled to have this opportunity to have Leah join us. She'll make some opening remarks, uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A from the audience. Leah, welcome back to the Energy Policy Seminar. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. It's great to be here. I did my PhD at MIT, and I came to this series all the time when I was a grad student here, so it is an honor to be speaking in it. And I had the great pleasure of taking coursework with Henry Lee, who is still here teaching all the brilliant students at the Kennedy School, so it's really great to be back. Um, as Joe mentioned, I'm at the Radcliffe Institute for the year, where I'm writing a book about my experience working on the Inflation Reduction Act, which also looks at the experience of other people who worked in the Senate and the White House to try to pass this bill. This um, that I'm presenting today is more of an academic paper that I'm working on with one of my graduate students, Olivia Quinn at UC Santa Barbara, who worked with me on a bunch of the policy reports that we published alongside Evergreen Action. So I just want to acknowledge Olivia's contributions. So just to give an overview of the talk that I'm going to give today, um, I want to talk about the way that we found ourselves in a policy-making window of opportunity, you know, to use Kingdon's sort of framework, John Kingdon's work, uh, Agendas and Alternatives. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it, especially as a, um, a student here. It looks at policymaking. And so I want to talk about how did this window of opportunity open, how did activists use it, and how did we get the law passed? So first, we had scientific targets that were put forth um, in part by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I'm going to talk a bunch about that, that really created a sense of what was necessary and by when, you know, targets and timetables. And activists, uh, as well as outsider activist groups and insider politicians, organized to push a climate policy into this window of opportunity, um, primarily through the Democratic primary, which I'll talk about. And that really got climate on the agenda within the Democratic Party. And then the climate coalition that came together around this window of opportunity was far more durable than it was at the last time that we had an opportunity to pass a federal climate bill during the Waxman-Markey um, years, which I'm sure some of you remember, um, and other people like Matt Mildenberger, who's in the room, have written a book about called Carbon Captured. Um, and so that work of holding together a coalition was really important to actually getting the bill over the finish line in a way that during the Waxman-Markey years, that really did not happen. The coalition fractured and did not hang together at the end. So let's rewind in time to a younger looking senator, or I believe he was a representative at the time from Massachusetts, uh, sen now Senator Markey. Um, a wonderful human being, might I add, huge fan of him. He's really great. And you know the work that 
groups like the Sunrise Movement did to help him get reelected, I think is extremely important for the story that I'm going to tell about the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, because he really championed that bill. He championed things like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which we heard Jahi Weiss talk about in this series. He was really uh, a very important advocate this time around, as well as last time around. So you may recall that after um, President Biden, sorry, President Obama was elected, uh, there was an opportunity to pass a climate bill. And it was called the Waxman Markey Bill, or more formally, the American Clean Energy and Security Act. And a lot of the work to design that bill was done through a sort of insider strategy. Uh, this was done largely by the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, and they worked very closely with policymakers in the White House, in the House, and the Senate. And they did not work as uh, broadly across the climate movement, nor did they really focus on generating outside public support for this bill. So it was kind of a technocratic insider strategy. And this uh, has been documented in an important uh, working paper by Theda Scotchpole here at Harvard University in the Gov Department, as well as by Matt Mildenberger in his book. Uh, of course, that window of opportunity rapidly closed when Massachusetts really spoiled the party there and the Democrats lost their supermajority in the Senate. And there was kind of a theory at that time that maybe this could be a bipartisan bill, right? Maybe some Republicans would come to the table, uh, but they never did, not even a single Republican vote. And so there were a bunch of lessons learned from this time period about you know, the possibility of legislating through climate policy in a bipartisan way. Um, and the importance of using the windows of opportunity when they arise, because those windows will rapidly close. So let's fast forward in time to uh, 2018. Some of you may remember that a really important report came out at that time, and I'm going to talk about that. But this really is the sort of era that the Green New Deal as an idea gets on the agenda. And we start to have the beginnings of an opportunity to pass a bill. Of course, President Trump is in office at the time. The Democrats are not controlling uh, the, the Congress. And so there isn't an opportunity yet to actually move a climate bill. But when we talk about policymaking, we always have to go further back in time, particularly to look at the ideas that were around at that moment in time. My late advisor, Judy Laser at MIT, always talked about the role of ideas in setting the agenda. And this is really what we see here. So some of you may remember this report. It came out in October 2018. It's the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. I don't know if people remember the origin of this report, but basically through the UNFCCC process, a bunch of countries, primarily um, small island developing states, got together and they said, we want the IPCC to write a report about what is necessary to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. These countries believed, probably accurately, that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees was existential for them, that their countries would literally be underwater if we went past those warming targets. And so they asked this very important scientific body, which I'm hopeful that many of you are familiar with, to write a report about what would it take to limit warming to that level. So that was the, that was the assignment for the scientists. It's not that the scientists came up with this target themselves. And so they wrote this technical report. And it said basically that if you want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, you have to cut carbon pollution by 45% below 2005 levels this decade by 2030. So another way to put that is you got to cut carbon pollution by about half in the next 12 years. And that is the way that the activists ended up framing the issue. This is the sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office that the Sunrise Movement organized uh, just after Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was elected, she came to this protest. And you'll notice that they don't have signs that say Green New Deal. Um, they have signs that say, we have 12 years. What's your plan? And so that sense of a target and a timetable was really central to the way that the media explained this report and the ways activists used it to create a sense of urgency. Uh, of course, many scientists, I think of somebody like Catherine Hayhoe, for example, hate this. They really don't like that there's like a, you know, 12 years or we're all doomed kind of scenario, because of course that isn't the case for climate change, right? Every uh, tenth of a degree matters. Every ton of carbon pollution that we cut matters. We don't go off a massive cliff in 2030. Um, but this framing of a target and a timetable proved really essential to opening up a policy window and actually getting a climate bill passed. 
So the next phase we're going to talk about is agenda setting, getting these ideas onto the Democratic prim onto the Democratic agenda through the primary. And what activists did is that they used that primary. Does anybody remember how many people ran in the Democratic primary? It's a solid two dozen. It's like more than much more than a baker's dozen. A lot of people ran for the Democratic nomination. And what that created was an opportunity to create a race to the top because there were so many different candidates trying to stand out and show that they were, for example, the climate candidate, you know, or the candidate on health care or whatever the topic was. And many activists use that as a way to drive ambition. And I would also just like to acknowledge the work of my late friend Adi Barkin, who used that as well as an opportunity to push for uh, health care policy and policy to support um, home health care aids for people living with disabilities. So this was happening across multiple policy issues, including, of course, climate change. So you can see here, this is the work of the Sunrise Movement. They, for example, gave grades. This is not a very great scale. I got to say it's out of 200, <laughs> untraditional. But you get the idea that Biden didn't do so well on his first uh, plan. They gave him an F minus, not very nice. Um, I don't know if you get grades like that at Harvard too often. I hear you give higher know, grades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah, it was a little bit harsh. It's like salt in the wound over here. Anyway, um, somebody like Elizabeth Warren, and it wasn't just Sunrise doing this, right? We've got Greenpeace, Data for Progress, League of Conservation Voters. I mean, this is a more traditional uh, metric that's used based on historic votes, because of course she's in the Senate. Um, and so there was all this work to try to summarize and grade and analyze these plans. And I ended up playing a large role in that too. I started to use the expertise that I had gained in part um, through uh, working on climate policy for at that time about 15 years to analyze these plans and say, here's what they do. Here's how fast they would get us. Here's what the plan is. Um, and this was really my first foray into uh, getting involved in the policymaking process, which was pretty fun. The other thing that climate activists did is that they drove attention to, to the media asking questions about climate change to candidates. One of the things that activists and journalists and academics called for was a climate debate. Why does this matter? Why do we need a climate debate? Well, if you had watched the debates, which I, I sadly say I like watched all of them, there would be like one question about climate change. It would be three quarters of the way through the debate and it would be like, are you trying to take away our hamburgers? I kid you not. That would be the level of discourse on this particular really important issue that all of you care about since you're here. And so what people said is that if we want candidates to actually understand climate change, if we want to have an in-depth conversation on this thing, we can't just have one question about hamburgers. We have to actually have 30 minutes per candidate for the leading candidates where they have to unpack this. And so... Thankfully, a bunch of the leading networks did this. They ran these like eight hour marathons of debates, which I watched. And it meant that each candidate had to actually prepare and understand the um, climate policy to the degree that they always understand, for example, healthcare policy. If you ask people, you know, single payer, Medicare, Medicaid, anybody running for president would be able to talk through the differences in healthcare policy. But that is not the case for climate and energy policy. And so this really forced candidates to have to study up. It was like a little bit of an on-air exam. Now, of course, one person ran for president who really shaped the conversation around climate change, and that is Governor Jay Inslee from Washington State. He had a number of advisors who had been working for him uh, going back to the time where he was in the House of Representatives and, of course, in his time as governor, who were very focused on climate change. And Governor Inslee said that he was running for uh, president to elevate the issue of climate change. And so this, uh, this particular campaign ended up putting out over 200 pages of policy documents creating a pretty detailed roadmap to what it would look like to implement a really ambitious climate policy were there an opportunity. And what they really focused on was sort of this new idea of standards, investments, and justice. So rather than, for example, a market-based approach like a carbon tax or a cap and trade um, policy being the center of this plan, they said, let's set standards. Let's look at things like, for example, clean electricity standards, car standards. Let's set the rules of the road, literally and figuratively. Let's put investments. Let's use industrial policy to drive the economy using the power of the federal government in the direction that we want to go. And let's use justice. Let's center environmental justice and equity in our policy. 
And they also, of course, wrote very specific plans on things like clean electricity, creating extremely ambitious targets like 100% clean electricity by 2035. Um, and this ended up, of course, I don't know if you know the end of the story. This man, not the president of the United States. He did not win the nomination. He didn't even make it that far. But he's still the governor of Washington State, still doing cool stuff. And what happened was when the campaign was over, they decided that they would form a new campaign, a campaign for a law rather than a campaign for a specific person to become president. And that organization was called, is called Evergreen Action. I got very involved in this organization and used uh, really that partnership to do a lot of the work on, on what would eventually at the very you know, 11th point five hour become the Inflation Reduction Act. So this uh, environment of all these people running for president, all these groups evaluating these candidates and a candidate like Jay Inslee in the race centering climate change led to uh, pre now President Biden, then Vice President Biden, going from a pretty bad first plan that included a uh, literal copying and pasting from in industry websites in the first version of the plan, which was quite problematic because if you remember when Biden first ran for president, there was a whole plagiarism drama and uh, he ended up dropping out. So went from that to a really exciting plan um, at the end of the day that a lot of people, including myself, lauded him for that included many of the targets and timetables from uh, Inslee's roadmap. Now, of course, the real ending of the story is that President Biden won, yay, at least in my opinion, big yay. Um, and some of these ideas, like trying to drive towards 100% clean electricity by 2035, were core parts of the platform that he ended up running on. Okay, so that is the context. Of course, we have the Georgia runoff. Um, we suddenly have uh, Senator Schumer being in the majority in the Senate. We have, uh, of course, Nancy Pelosi uh, running the House at the time. We have a trifecta, right? And so this is an opportunity for activists and, of course, policymakers in the House of Representatives, as well as the Senate, as well as the White House, to develop the Democratic climate agenda and try to actually get a bill over the finish line. So I want to highlight some of the work that I personally did with various other groups, but of course there was tons of stuff done in this area. Um, working with Evergreen and Data for Progress, I wrote a, a report which looked at how we could get to 100% clean electricity by 2035, outlining things like tax credits, additional incentives for building clean energy in disadvantaged communities, additional incentives for building clean energy with labor standards. These are things that actually ended up in the final law, very exciting. And other ideas like what eventually became the Clean Electricity Performance Program, which was an ambitious clean electricity standard that uh, Senator Manchin uh, killed in October of that year. But before that time was being debated in the House of Representatives. And it's interesting because in the last uh, few weeks, I've really come to think about how, you know, of course, when we lost the SEP, it was called the Clean Electricity Performance Program. I was personally sad and I felt that it wouldn't make as, the bill as strong. but you know, there's such an important set of other policies that we had to get over the finish line. And many people, for example, the analysts at Rhodium were saying that you didn't need to do that. There were other groups like Energy Innovation doing modeling, saying you actually quite needed that. Because the thing about the Clean Electricity Performance Program is that it included both a, a carrot and a stick. And a tax incentive is really just a carrot. And unfortunately, what we're seeing right now with uh, integrated resource plans in a number of utilities is that the carrots of these tax credits is proving to not be enough. So for example, the Tennessee Valley Authority is currently planning uh, to build a lot more gas plants even, and basically planning to build no clean energy, no solar and batteries, for example. And that's because there is no stick that's actually forcing them to do it. We also have companies like Duke Energy, for example, that are proposing the same integrated resource plan from before the Inflation Reduction pa Act passed till after. And so there is something missing, I would say, in terms of pushing, uh, for example, in the electric utility sector, the transition at the pace and scale that's necessary. Unfortunately, many utility executives are not taking these sort of carrots and signals seriously enough to actually move us in the right direction, even though financially it makes sense for them to do that. Uh, as well as with Rewiring America and the Center for American Progress, uh, I was part of a group that helped to really think about how we can get household level incentives for things like heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and electrification of buildings. Um, so 
what really, you know, I, I'll just say that I have not ever been to a COP, you know, Convention of the Parties. I've been working on climate change for two decades. I've never been to a COP. And I, I think that's great that people go to COPs. But, you know, I've often felt, based on my political science research, that domestic policy is where a lot of the action happens and tended to discount the international process. So I'm giving you that context to say I've really changed my mind about that because I think that what the international process did for the domestic debate in the United States through things like that IPCC report coming out of the UNFCCC process was that it set the terms of what was necessary, right? It said, here's where we have to go and buy wet. And that 45% cut became absolutely central to activists, as I've already talked about, adopting that as a target, saying you have to cut carbon pollution in half this decade, and to the president uh, actually adopting a target of cutting carbon pollution by 50 to 52 percent below um, 2005 levels by 2030, right? So that's even more ambitious than this 45 percent cut. If we didn't have that benchmark of that 45 percent, we wouldn't have had such an ambitious target coming out of the White House. And so I began to see how there's a real trickle down from the international negotiating process and from the work that scientists do into what we see in domestic policymaking. And this became the most clear when it came to the work of Senator Schumer's office, which developed a very interesting modeling tool they called the Ambition Tracker. And what the ambition tracker would do is it would take the piece of legislation or in the much earlier days before it was necessary legislation, it would take the various policies that were being uh, discussed with Senator Manchin primarily, uh, and of course, uh, Senator Schumer, and then many of the sort of climate hawks like uh, Markey and Carper and Senator Whitehouse and Schatz and Smith, and I'm probably forgetting important ones, um, oh, Van Hollen um, and uh, Heinrich, all this sort of coalition of climate hawks. And they would say, here's how much carbon pollution we would cut if we keep the package like this. And as Senator Manchin began to cut off certain policies like the Clean Electricity Performance Program, what they would do is they would go back to their ambition tracker and they would put in uh, new sort of numbers to make sure that they would still cut carbon pollution by about, they were aiming for 45%. So this is the time period before the, the Clean Electricity Performance Program was cut, where they did get a 45% cut. And if you remember, when the final bill came out, it was about a 40% cut, as done as analyzed um, by Jesse Jenkins' group at Princeton, as well as uh, Energy Innovation and Rhodium. So this international target really did affect the way that policymaking was happening inside, for example, the Senate and the House of Representatives and the White House. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the outside game, which was what I was very involved in. The way that uh, networks and strategy worked together to make sure that we had coherence. And, you know, that, uh, at least in my head, that work came out of my first book, uh, which Joe uh, mentioned I presented in this series in the past called Short Circuiting Policy, in which I looked at the erosion of clean electricity uh, laws in the states. And what I found is that if you want to successfully pass a clean electricity law, you have to have a network of advocates working together, that you can't have isolated groups that don't agree. Because if you have a fragmented advocacy coalition, you will always have a unified opposition when it comes to, for example, utilities, industrial energy users, et cetera. So it's very important that the coalition actually hang together. And what I started to realize at this point was that if we could get to 100% clean electricity and we could electrify as much as we could in our economy, we could actually cut around three quarters of current carbon pollution. Um, that's because, for example, parts of heavy industry can be electrified um, through things like beverage and food manufacturing, um, pulp and paper. Uh, we can also electrify most of our transportation sector, though not all of it, of course. We can electrify buildings. And when you add all that up alongside the clean electricity, you can get to three quarters of the climate solution. So I thought, OK, I should work on clean electricity and electrification. That's A, what I know about anyway. If you'd ask me to work on agriculture, it would be pretty bad at it. And B, it would cut three quarters of the carbon pollution. So I went about trying to build advocacy groups, advocacy coalitions that would be able to coordinate and hang together so that we wouldn't have the same kind of fragmented situation at the end of the Waxman-Markey debate. 
Um, I helped build alongside Evergreen, uh, something that still operates today called the Clean Electricity Group. It included several hundred advocates, advocates organizations who worked together to strategize on policy design, on uh, lobbying the Hill, on organizing um, sort of grassroots work, um, and, and also doing comms around clean electricity. With, with Rewiring America, we established something called the Federal Electrification Policy Coalition, which again still operates today, and it worked to br bring together environmental justice groups, um, affordable housing advocates, of course climate groups, to work on federal uh, electrification policy for buildings. You know, there was a pretty robust advocacy community around cars, electric cars, because there are companies who are doing that, but there was not the same kind of advocacy work around buildings. And so we focused on that. And of course, I just want to add, um, acknowledge that there were many other really important networks that were operating that I did not you know, establish or and did not really participate in. For example, the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, which is a coalition between environmental justice groups and Big Greens that was established a few years before this time period. And that was really important to getting a lot of the environmental justice provisions into the law as well as a lot of coordination through things like the Climate Action Campaign, which again is another group of sort of big greens and some environmental justice groups. And so this infrastructure, these networks were really important to having coordination across the movement. So there wasn't fragmentation at the, uh, you know, when the final bill text was released. Um, and a lot of the substance of the work that these groups were doing were both sort of inside and outside advocacy. So going to offices to talk to them about various policies, doing organizing, you know, trying to get people to do, for example, um, direct actions, doing comms work to drive stories into the media in a unified way. That was very important. And there was very talented comms people working in this coalition. And then a fairly open policy making process. So rather than having one organization design a lot of the policy in concert with, for example, the Senate and the House, what we tried to do was actually uh, allow many groups to participate and try to influence the way policy uh, design happened. And I think that was pretty important because uh, in the past, many environmental justice groups, for example, have been very critical that they have not been able to have a seat at the table. And if you heard Jahi Weiss's talk um, from a few weeks ago, you hopefully got a sense that a bunch of the really big ideas that environmental justice groups were pushing, things like cleaning up pollution from ports, the, of course, Green Bank that he talked a lot about, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, as well as other kinds of block grants that would fund environmental justice community groups to actually engage in the process, that these things uh, were part of the final bill. And Senator Markey, as I mentioned, deserves a lot of credit for helping to champion those policies specifically. Okay, so enactment, the sort of, you know, bill becomes a law, part of the story. So you may remember that all of this had to go through budget reconciliation. As I mentioned, there didn't seem to be any uh, Republican votes for climate package. And some of the staffers who were very central on the House and set aside, one of whom is in the room today, had had that experience in the past of realizing that no Republicans are going to vote for a climate bill. And so they didn't want to waste their time trying to get a Republican on board. And so that meant that the process had to go through budget reconciliation, which is a technical process that involves 50 votes plus the uh, tie-breaking vote of the vice president, um, and everything has to have a budgetary impact. And it's a technical process that involves the parliamentarian and a bunch of rules called the, the Byrd rules after the late Senator Byrd, and it's a fairly complicated thing. I had to learn far more about parliamentarian process than I ever wanted to know. I now have actually a book about this big. It is 1,600 pages, I kid you not, uh, on my desk written by a Senate staffer that describes all the history of this process and how it works in excruciating detail, just to give you a flavor. It's, called, it's a red book, too, just to add a little bit of cherry on top there. Um, so in the early 2021, the, the president really played an important role in setting the agenda, as the president often does through things like the State of the Union and through putting out plans. And he released the American Jobs Plan, which really tried to set the framework for what a climate policy uh, would be. And many of the things that were in this plan did end up in the final bill that was passed. Uh, a little bit about some of the outside strategy. As I mentioned, I was very influenced by the work of Theda Scotchpole and Matt Mildenberger looking at the Wax and Markey bill and why it had failed. And so part of what I tried to do along with other activist groups uh, was uh, groups like Evergreen Action and the Sunrise Movement was to make sure that we didn't find ourselves in the same situation. 
One thing that um, Scotch Bowl writes about in her uh, paper is that there was no uh, coordinated pressure campaign on Congress from the public during the waxman Markey days. And so I was hoping that a big group like the Sierra Club, for example, would start to do a big calling campaign for Congress, but they never really did. And so what I decided to do um, with no money and not a grant or anything like that, but with an amazing activist who's sort of local to here, Jamie Henn, who runs a group called Fossil Free Media. It comes out of 350 with Bill McKibben. He's a co-founder. Um, we started this uh, little phone dialer and, and launched a little campaign called Call for Climate, which said, you know, here's the kinds of things we want. It gave people a script, it gave them a phone number to call, and it would patch them through to specific offices. And we generated tens of thousands of phone calls by doing this, which again, was zero dollars. I didn't get paid a dollar to do this. Nobody got paid a dollar to do this. And this was the kind of, and actually I just met um, last week, a business group, which inspired by the work that we do and created a business dialer that businesses could share with their employees so that their employees could call Congress. That, so that was basically a mimic of what we did. And the Sunrise Movement and Justice Democrats built their own. And what we tried to do was actually make sure that Congress was hearing from everyday people about climate change. When it looked like the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill would move forward without the climate bill, um, Senator Markey went on TV and he said, no climate, no deal. And some of the brilliant people at Evergreen Action, like Jamal Rod, who is a very good comms um, a professional, he said, that's a slogan right there, no climate, no deal. And so they built a little campaign alongside Sunrise Movement, which got senators to sign on to say, we will not vote for a bipartisan bill and also members of the House uh, of Representatives, we will not vote for a climate bill without, uh, with, sorry, a bipartisan infrastructure bill without a climate bill moving alongside it. This set up obviously a lot of tension between the House and the Senate to try to figure out how they were gonna get both of these uh, bills passed. And if you're interested in some of the history of this, I'd also recommend a book by Franklin Foer called The Last Politician, which talks a lot about the history of the, the first, um, few years of the Biden administration. Of course, um, Nancy Pelosi did it once and she did it again. She actually managed to pass a climate bill at the time that it, she, because remember Waxman Markey did pass the house. That was the point of that story. Um, they, the bill that passed the house had $555 billion in climate investments. Um, and you can see here that a lot of groups, this is a, a doc, a, an image from Climate Power, trying to think about the climate test, which looked at how far would that package actually get us towards the goals that we had before us. But of course, that's not where the story ends. Alas, then Senator Manchin went on television in December of uh, 2021, giving uh, some of us gray hairs at a far too young age and said that he would no longer support any uh, climate bill. Um, so that was a bummer right there. Um, in the new year, a lot, the, the House and the Senate and the White House turned to other issues like voting rights and sort of said that, okay, we got to give uh, Manchin a cooling off period here. And really the negotiations became quite bilateral between Schumer and Manchin at that time because Manchin was very angry at the White House. Russia, of course, invaded Ukraine driving up energy prices globally. And that began to create another uh, policy making window of opportunity. And I thought back to the course that I took with uh, Professor Lee here and how energy shocks often create a window of opportunity that when we have high energy prices, like during the 1970s, for example, that's often the time that we pass laws, the Energy Policy Act of 1992, the Energy Policy Act of 2005. When energy prices get high, Congress gets attention on the issue and actually acts. And so this did begin to basically drive attention to um, energy again. And you could see this in the statements that, for example, Senator Manchin was making at the time. So uh, then Senator Manchin killed the bill again. That was really, really, really bad um, because you know we had been hearing from Senator Schumer's team that they were very close to a deal. Um, I cried a lot. Uh, it was very sad. I had newborn uh, twin children at the time and I stayed up very late and I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times uh, criticizing Manchin for what he did and they ran that the entire weekend, which they don't do generally. So clearly it was getting a lot of clicks and play. And I've since talked to many activists who said who they personally texted Manchin. There's many stories about senators going up to him and he clearly felt an enormous amount of public pressure to a degree that he had not 
experience up to that point. Um, and he, I don't think that he wanted to be the one person who did this uh, to humanity, so to speak. And so on Monday, he, so this was on a Thursday that the bill fell apart. Over the weekend, um, you know, Schumer and Manchin didn't talk. And on Monday, he went back to Senator Schumer and he said, are you still mad at me? Um, <laughs> I, I think that's like actually what the quote in the media is like, I still think there's something we could get done. He also called um, Brian Deese um, in the White House at the time, the National Economic Advisor. And uh, so there was a few people in the White House who knew um, like Ricchetti and Deese and Klain and President Biden, that was it. And then a few, and then people, a very, very tight circle around Schumer and Manchin knew. And they began to basically meet in the basement of the Capitol in secret to decide on the final uh, bill. And I've heard this story, which I haven't been able to fact check uh, yet. And I don't know, this was like a crazy time in my life, obviously. But I think that the, so, the, so they ended up getting to a deal, right? And remember the CHIPS Act is going through the Senate at the time. And that's a bipartisan bill. And uh, McConnell had said he wouldn't like give the votes for that if the uh, Build Back Better agenda was still happening. So everybody thought it was very, very, very much dead because these were secret negotiations. And they passed the CHIPS bill on Wednesday morning, the 27th. And interestingly, Manchin doesn't even vote for that bill because he has COVID at the time. So he, so the final agreement between him and Schumer over the Inflation Reduction Act is done over Zoom. And the name of the Inflation Reduction Act actually comes from Manchin himself because he had been so worried about inflation. And he said, I think he said in a passing remark to some of the staffers, well, what if we called it the Inflation Reduction Act? And they said, well, that's a great idea, Senator. And he insisted that he would be the one who would handle the messaging of this bill when it came out. Sometimes people say that, like, I wrote the Inflation Reduction Act, which I find laughable. I did not. A, I didn't know it was called the Inflation Reduction Act, so how did I do that? And B, it's like 700 pages, so no. Um, this, when this was put on a press release on Joe Manchin's website, I was so surprised as 99.9% .9 of everyone else in the world. There was literally, like, 25 human beings who knew this was happening at the time. And then, of course, there was a very large uh, dash to get the bill over the finish line. If people are interested in some of the drama that came after that involving Senator Cinema in particular, happy to talk about that. She basically made um, water rights along the Colorado River have to get negotiated in an eight-day period, which is not awesome to do. I think it was a heroic act by Senator Schumer's staff uh, to be able to do that. And then um, the final votes happened. And keep in mind, right, there's no room for error. Uh, was it was it Senator Cardin who was like being wheeled around in a wheelchair at the time um, because he'd broken his hip? Am I right about this? Um, they, and, and it actually started to get really cold because remember there's a votorama that happens through the night and the Republicans are trying to derail the process. And Senator Feinstein was very old at the time. And she start, when you get really tired, your body can't thermoregulate as well. And so she started, I mean, like I'm telling you, this was a very narrow opportunity to get Get this bill passed, and hallelujah, the bill did pass. Okay, um, if you'd like to know what's in the bill, of course, there's a thousand and one ways to find out. You could read the bill, although that would take you many, many weeks. It'd be like reading the Bible, um, not literally, but metaphorically. Um, and but one thing I'd recommend is this explainer that we put together at Evergreen Action. It's just a really helpful document, and I'm going to talk through some of the main buckets of sort of what's in the IRA. So there are, of course, clean electricity investments, tax credits for renewables and batteries. Keep in mind that some of these uh, tax credits, they didn't, they didn't qualify for batteries in the past, and so that was a really important addition. And these are uncapped tax credits, meaning when the, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, makes an estimate that the bill is $370 billion or whatever number you've seen, this is completely inaccurate in truth because tax credits can be spent unlimited. Um, and then some parts of the bill are actual grants that have specific numbers associated with them. For example, money to help replace coal plants. Um, there's a lot of what we could call industrial policy that was very intentional on the part of many folks in the House and the Senate to think about how do we reshape the politics by actually building clean um, technologies in the United States. And so during between the, the death of the bill in 2021, when Senator Manchin goes on Fox News and the reappearing of it in late July, they came up with the tax credit in the Senate called 45X, which was also a way of dealing with a lot of Senator Manchin's concerns around EV subsidies. He didn't want to give people money, rich people money to buy Teslas essentially. 
Um, and he was also quite influenced by Toyota, which, uh, of course, makes the Prius and is not very uh, far along the road when it comes to electric cars compared to other competitors because they put so much effort into hybrids. And so he was pretty anti EVs. And this was a challenge because you may remember Senator Schumer had put a lot into EVs specifically. He'd come up with a Clean Cars for America proposal. And so when they thought they were going to get nothing on direct consumer support for EVs, they thought about ways they could basically go up the supply chain for domestic manufacturing of EVs and subsidize the cars that way, right? Because if you think about how you give a subsidy, you could either give it directly to a human being, like the person buying the car, or you could give it to the producer of the cars upstream, and that would also reduce the cost. And so that, so the concept was that 45X would maybe reduce the cost of an EV like $2,000 by a car um, per car. They also uh, included many things specifically for Senator Manchin. And when you think about like, why did Senator Manchin agree at the end of the day, there were many things in the bill that he wanted that were going to benefit his community, including, for example, extensions um, and reappropriations for the Black Lung Disability Trust Fund, which was, he was being lobbied on by his own constituents uh, quite heavily. And things like 48C, which were targeted investments into coal communities, basically energy communities that had been uh, disinvested in. Um, the Defense Production Act, uh, which I had a bunch of uh, role in helping uh, encourage the president to use during the war in Ukraine, included a bunch of money for heat pumps and critical mineral, mineral manufacturing. We now have new facilities being built in the United States to make heat pumps, which I'm very excited about because I helped make that happen. A lot of consumer facing incentives. There are rebate programs that Rewiring America worked a lot on to help people, especially low income people, electrify their homes. Uh, these are called HERA and homes, and you probably don't want to know all the drama they're in, but there's much. Um, there's also a tax credit called 25C for heat pumps that can give you up to $2,000 off a heat pump or a heat pump hot water heater. I worked very much on that one. Um, those EV incentives that I mentioned. Finally, Senator Manchin did agree to them, although he put so many stipulations on them, it's rather difficult to use. And then the Green Bank that we heard um, Jahi talk so much about. The Green Bank Awards are actually going to be announced fairly shortly, which is very exciting. Uh, I believe Massachusetts applied for one, actually. but And they've already sent out the rejections, but not the acceptances. It's a sort of funny moment that we're in. Um, a lot for environmental justice. This is probably, I, I mean, this is the largest investment in environmental justice in American history, as well as being the largest investment in climate um, and clean energy in American history. So there are things like, for example, community block grants to go to organizations working on environmental justice. $3 billion is an enormous amount of money for that. So that's really exciting. And as well as cleaning up pollution from ports. Um, and then a lot of other things like $20 billion for climate smart agriculture, money for decarbonizing heavy industry. We probably could have used more on that. A methane fee that Senator Carper uh, worked very hard on. Hydrogen incentives like 45V, as well as uh, CCS incentives like 45Q. And there's like a lot more things. But this is enough. I've probably told you enough. Um, so some thoughts about why did it happen? So as I've kind of already spoken about, I think that uh, these benchmarks that came from scientists and activists were really important to setting the ambitious targets, right? Like, how do we say if we did enough or not on climate policy? Wh what do we mean? And I will also say, although I didn't put it here, groups like Energy Innovation and Rhodium and Jesse's work through the Repeat Project at Princeton University, Jesse Jenkins, were really important to actually analyzing if these policies would get us where we need to go. And that... Um, scientifically informed decision-making process is not really generally how we tend to make policy. So it's kind of an interesting way that it happened. The role of activists cannot be overstated. I don't think that we would have this policy, this law, if it wasn't, for example, for the Sunrise Movement and somebody like Varshini Prakash, a Massachusetts native, um, who worked to really set the agenda through launching ideas like a Green New Deal and through folks like um, Sam Ricketts, who worked for the uh, Inslee campaign and then later co-founded Evergreen Action and really pushed specific ideas of standards, investments, and justice. And I will also say that I think the coalitional work that was so central to this moment in time was really important. There was so much conflict, particularly at the end. There was actually a campaign run at the very last minute when the bill reappeared targeting the squad, sort of the left groups in the House, and, and they said, um, 
messages out to the district. I don't know how they got phone numbers. There's a journalist, for example, named Alex Kaufman, who lives in Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district, and he would get text messages at this time saying, this bill is bad for environmental justice. You need to call your representative and vote no. And this was not an environmental justice campaign. It was actually probably being funded by the fossil fuel industry. And so there was a lot of misinformation and attempts to attack the policy um, sort of being cloaked in a left frame that really could have fractured the coalition. But all the work that was done to try to hold it together, despite some of the poison pills that Manchin required in the bill, like for example, auction requirements for oil and gas, that was very essential to actually getting it passed. Okay, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Leah. Uh, before I go to the audience, I'll uh, ask a question about institutions. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you described how the nature of budget reconciliation forced the bill to address specific kinds of issues. Yes. Uh, specifically on how we either appropriate monies or how we use the tax code. Yes. Um, we had, as a part of the deal, which you didn't mention, there was this second package, which was on infrastructure yes. and on the siding of infrastructure and yes. the permitting of infrastructure. Yes. And there's been a lot of discussion about how much we'll be able to make of, say, subsidies for renewable power will depend in part on our ability to build out transmission yes. and in general site more energy infrastructure. Yes. Of course, that has a different voting threshold. It didn't get passed. Would like your thoughts on first sort of the politics of agreeing to sort of two bills that have different kinds of institutional hurdles to clear in order yes. to pass the Senate, but also more generally about what are the prospects for meeting renewable power goals, as you describe yeah. them here, given that we're still trying to make changes on the margin yeah. with our rules that govern the siding of energy infrastructure and what might be the prospects for anything more comprehensive in that space. Yeah, great. Well, we also had Anna Unruh Cohen come and give a great talk in the series, and she talked a lot about this, and I took a lot of notes. And she, I mean, she has a current job as sort of a government worker, so she had to use her words carefully, but I still learned a lot from what they're doing. And it seemed from that talk that they have made some changes uh, internally through sort of uh, executive action that are trying to go in the direction of what would have been in that package. Of course, some parts of that still passed through um, bipartisan bills, such as, for example, the Mountain Valley Pipeline requirement, the permit that uh, Manchin really wanted. That side deal, as it was called, or the dirty deal, or whoever you want to call it, um, was very controversial within the climate movement. My understanding of what happened was that, you know, when Schumer and uh, Manchin got to that secret deal, they eventually did call up um, leader Pelosi and said, okay, would you agree to this other deal as well? And of course, and she said yes. And then there was going to be a whole process around after the fact getting that done. Um, and it didn't end up passing. There was a lot of opposition against it and various folks in the Senate who didn't support it. Um, I think, for example, Senator Markey said, sure, I'll like support you bringing it up for a vote, but he didn't say I'm going to vote for it. Um, so, you know, there have been some things that have been done through executive action. Um, there have been, there are probably other things that need to be done. There's not as much investment in transmission and sort of clearing some of the roadblocks to that. If people are interested, there's this very, uh, I don't know, depressing book called uh, Superpower by um, Russell Gold, which talks about the history of trying to build a transmission line in the United States and how it, I think he thought he was like writing a hero's quest that would have a happy ending. And no, the transmission line does not get built. So it's kind of a tragedy. Um, but I recommend that book if you want to understand some of the challenges. Um, so there are definitely some bottlenecks. That being said, there was another bill, which is what I thought you were first saying, the bipartisan infrastructure law or the IIJA which we all said is not a climate bill, and it wasn't. And they did water down all the things that we wanted, like clean drinking water and charging infrastructure. It was like cents on the dollar. But that money is now getting out the door. And so, for example, they put a lot of money uh, for grid infrastructure in that particular bill. For example, there's a program at DOE called GRIP, the Grid Resilience Innovation Program, which is funding a lot of these um, projects right now that can start to fill some of these gaps. So there is still some money for some of this infrastructure, uh, including in the infrastructure bill, but there's probably more that can be done on the permitting uh, process. And I will also say, when I started, when I was doing my PhD at MIT, I started a project like a long time ago about opposition to wind energy. And I just published it in PNAS this fall. So if you're interested in reading about it, 
we look at uh, over a 16 year period between 2000 and 2016 opposition to wind projects and we find that basically it's growing over time and that one in five projects are opposed. And if you look at some of the um, data that the MIT Rhodium project that Brian Deese is working on, uh, looking at investments in wind energy is basically flat right now and falling because there's been a lot of opposition to wind energy and a lot of the good sites for wind onshore have already been built and of course since we're in Massachusetts, we know all the challenges with offshore opposition as well. So there's definitely a lot of challenges, particularly on the wind development side and transmission. I think that we're going to see a lot of progress in things like virtual power plants and batteries and solar and on-site flexible demand side through things like um, you know, heat pumps and smart appliances. So it may be that we start to push in a different direction on the grid where we go to a smaller scale potentially. And I don't think that's necessarily gonna get us to 100%, but that's gonna make more progress than I, um, than I think we fully understand in this moment because these things are quite new and that is very funded, right? We get batteries, we get switch gear, we get solar in the um, infrastructure deal, uh, sorry, in the IRA. So you gave me a long question, I give you a long answer. Right. I think we're even. Thanks. Okay, let me open it up for short questions, even if I did not and model short, short answers, question, yes. Uh, here from the audience. And I'll have uh, Liz pass it around. Sure, so following up on sort of that last point you made, that this is going to go down to a smaller level. Uh, so state and local governments are probably going to be tasked with doing a lot of this permitting and, mm -hmm. and implementation work. And, and I'm applying kind of, for money, too. Exactly. And I'm so I'm thinking about one thing you highlighted as key to the passage of the IRA, which was this durable coalition of activists. What role do you think this kind of durable coalition can have, given that the scale is going to be so much smaller and so much more fragmented in the issues that are being brought up? Yeah. So one of the things in the book that I wrote, Short Circuiting Policy, that I really learned is that activists are generally more effective during policy making and enactment. And that when it comes to implementation, that's often when they lose because um, opponents uh, become far more focused on you know, the implementation and regulatory process. That's what they're really good at. They literally have like teams of lawyers and specialists who are there to do that. And activists we lose a lot during policy, during the implementation phase. And I'm very much feeling that right now in terms of some of the rules and the direction that they're going. I don't love a lot of those things. Um, so I think that this particular time period is not the place where activists tend to shine as much. And that's unfortunate. And I don't necessarily have a great solution for that since I'm living it right now. Um, that being said, the, the stress on state and local capacity as well as tribal communities in terms of the amount of money that is being pushed through these channels can, is like very intense. Sam Ricketts is doing a lot of work on this right now. Um, and I think it's a very important thing. I was working with a county in Santa Barbara where I you know, normally live on a big, uh, we're working on a big virtual power plant project. And you know, the county was struggling to have the capacity to even apply for funds. And you just see that again and again. And when you think about, and you layer on top of that equity and thinking about environmental justice and making sure that the money is actually going to disadvantaged communities and thinking about the resources that those communities have to even apply for the money in the first place, it becomes very hard. That being said, having looked at these applications that you have to do to apply for federal funds, it's amazing how much the Biden administration has embedded labor standards, community benefits, um, Justice 40, that very important requirement, all throughout these applications. And I think that you know, we are going to see this law transform uh, the labor, uh, you know, basically the way that organized labor views climate and energy policy. We're going to see it transform um, equity like this law is going to have so much impact through these very technical requirements on these forms that everybody has to essentially fill out. So it's it's been very interesting to sort of actually look at the way that the money is going out the door. There's some things that are going to stress the system a lot, but there's also things that are going to push the system. And I think I personally feel a really hopeful direction from an equity perspective. So, yeah, okay, we're on now. Um... I was interested in the the point you raised about including scientific expertise in, in the development of the program. I think one thing that was distinctive about the IRA was the absence of energy economists in the design of the step, for, for example. And so I was wondering if 
sort of when the SEP came out and it sort of became understood that it was gameable uh, and that the fact that there was an asymmetry between the mm -hmm. rewards and the penalties meant that you could just cycle uh, money uh, without getting emissions reductions. And the fact that the models being used to predict what emissions reductions would be didn't account for that. It, did you sort of learn anything in that process about the value of red teaming uh, your policies, maybe with a, a group of experts in the field? Yeah, so that's just not accurate. There were economists involved. Resources for the Future, for example, was involved in the development and uh, you know, was very involved in some of the critiques that came from the economic community of the uh, design of the policy. I think that we felt that um, they, these were things that could be worked out during implementations and that there were safeguards that could be put in place. Many economists did not feel that way. And uh, the policy did not ultimately pass. But I just don't think it's accurate to say that there weren't economists involved in the development of the process, um, because Resources for the Future was. Um, and many economists you know, who are really top of their game in many ways uh, at RFF were part of that process. So first of all, it would be wonderful if you and the original energy gang would get the gang back together for <laughs> you have another. To ask Jigar. I think he has another job right now. I know, I know. I, I used to work for him. We can oh, talk you about did? that. Oh, I did. I'm but I'm still here. Um, so my question is a little different. I'm I'm wondering if you have any insights um, on the uh, you know they've set up the hydrogen hubs. They've been announced, and mm -hmm. now we're at a point where there's some concern about the 45. J and if existing nuclear is going to be able to take advantage of the, I know we're in sort of a holding pattern with the IRS, but I was wondering if you had your crystal ball, how do you think that's going to play out? You mean for 45V? I do, sorry. Yeah, you know, right. no worries. There's so many letters, U, V, X, Q, you name it. I mean, basically it's just alphabet soup if you want to do this kind of work at this point. Um, well, uh, so I have advocated for the three pillars, uh, and I've done that alongside a coalition of many other groups, um, in part because of gaming concerns that uh, basically you could be using existing power uh, that is clean and pulling it off of the grid, and rather than using it to power all the things we need to power, uh, using it to make hydrogen and then uh, not actually creating uh, clean electricity. And when you think about what the marginal unit of power is, if it's a dirty unit, Right. If you have coal or gas ramping at that particular time, you could actually be making uh, the energy electricity system dirtier. Now, many other folks, including brilliant people who I really adore and think have their heart in the right direction on climate, are very concerned about scaling hydrogen fast enough and thinking that we need to have enough supply in order to decarbonize steel, for example. And when we think about when there's investment decisions being made about where a steel plant will go, that they need to actually know they're gonna have enough supply. And so they feel that if in the short run, the um, hydrogen is literally a little bit dirtier, that's not so bad because in the long run, we'll have cleaner steel. And so that really is the question. Uh, you know, do you feel that you can make compromises from an environmental perspective in the short run to get longer term payoffs, or do you think that that is a bad trade off? Um, I tend to think that if you make that trade off and you build a bunch of, you know, if you build a bunch of hydrogen today that is dirtier, it will uh, really undermine the industry's uh, public support, including within the environmental movement, um, particularly with the environmental justice movement. There's already a lot of concern with hydrogen, and you kind of can't put the genie back in the bottle so to speak, if you make that decision. So in terms of where the Biden administration is likely to come down, I think it's hard to say, um, you know, with the final decision that they make. Uh, there's been some good direction, but there's been a lot of industry pushback against it, too. Um, I, I'll say that Rachel Fakhri and um, Sam Krasnow at NRDC have been doing an amazing work running a coalition uh, during implementation to actually try to win on that. So it's a bit hard to say where it's going to go. I don't think it's going to be the sort of three pillars that they want, unfortunately, in my view, um, because I think there's a view that, for example, hourly matching is not going to be ready yet. So uh, there's going to be some kind of compromise that's made. And I guess we'll know maybe in 10 to 15 years if it was a good decision or a bad decision what we ended up doing on hydrogen. I wanted to ask a bit about the future of the IRA. Mm -hmm. I mean, forecasting 2024, we're seeing one scenario where Biden can win re-election and they can maintain 50 seats in the Senate, a coalition that wouldn't have Manchin or Cinema. On the other side, we're seeing a potential Trump 2.0 agenda alongside them losing the Senate. So 
I guess my positive question is like, is let's say there is like maintaining of the Senate, what additional IRA contributions can happen and how much of the IRA is in jeopardy of, if not like legislative rollback, whatever the Trump Secretary of Energy is going to do to it? Yeah, great questions. Um, so there's lots of folks in the movement planning, doing scenario planning, essentially along the lines of what you described. And um, I personally feel, based in part on being a political scientist, that it will be difficult to roll back most or any of the IRA. Maybe I will knock on wood and regret saying that, but keep in mind that the grant money, for example, which tends to be what is most attacked right now by Republicans, if you look at some of the votes that are being made, for example, in the House, um, that money is going out the door, right? This, the GGRF funding announcement is going to happen. Um, not all of the uh, efficiency and electrification money will be out the door, but a bunch of it will, the climate pollution reduction grants. I mean, there's a Herculean effort going on right now at the DOE and the EPA and the HUD and USDA. I mean, you name it. Like, those people are working so hard um, to get money out the door. And it's it's a really Herculean effort because this is, these are budgets bigger sometimes than the entire agency. And an agency like EPA, as Jahi talked about, has not in the past done grants like this. They've been much more of a regulatory body. So it's very, very hard. So, But first of all, a lot of that grant money is going to be out the door. So you can't repeal it then. The tax credits are going to develop their own constituency. And in the past, when we've had, for example, the PTC and the ITC enacted, they have, they've often... Um, sunsetted and had a gap where they don't operate, but they've not been repealed because they end up having people who and companies who want them to operate. And of course, there's lots of work. If you want to look at the clean economy tracker, for example, which is a tool from Atlas Public Policy and Utah State University, which looks at, and of course, the MIT Rhodium tracker that I mentioned, they look at where is the money going in terms of these new investments. And what we find is that a majority is going to red districts. And so I think that these companies are going to show up and tell members of the House, for example, that they don't want them to repeal these policies. You even have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, saying nice things about battery manufacturing. So I think that some of, and that was really the theory of the politics of making things in the United States, that it would reshape the political economy. And we create feedback, as we say, policy feedback that would lock the policy in place. In terms of other things that I wish we could do more of, I think we're going to need more money for um, affordable housing. This was something that Senator Schumer really focused on and Manchin uh, dropped out of the bill. And so more money, for example, for greening affordable housing would be really great. Um, I think we also need more money to uh, electrify schools. That's something that I'm working a bunch on. Schools don't have enough money ever, and it's very hard for them to think about electrifying, and they become important community hubs, for example, during disasters or during heat waves. We're starting to see places like Pittsburgh, for example, shut down their entire school uh, district during heat waves. And, and these schools don't have air conditioning, and a heat pump can do both heating and cooling. So those are some of my personal things that I would love um, on, a, on a next round. Um, but you know, we will see if that even becomes an opportunity or not. Howdy. Um, just to go back to, uh, yeah, hi. Um, nice to I see you. I couldn't find yeah. you. Nice to see you. Um, just to go back to one of the, uh, the points with the CPP, the CPP and the, the challenge that you, may, you mentioned about how difficult it was to write what was an unprecedented law in our history. We've never used reconciliation yeah. climate um, or for any kind of massive spending program outside of one or two big shots on health care or taxes or assistant yeah. loans. Yeah. So the, the difficulty of writing complex yes. legislation, especially when the House had to pass laws, had to pass a bill that met a point of order of death and the wrong comma could have quite literally <laughs> killed the, the entire process. Yes. Right. So um, I, I'm sorry. This is Russell DeGraff, who um, was Schwarzenegger. Helped fellow. do that work. Exactly. Yeah, Schwarzenegger fellow and was working for the speaker for the, for the last decade. Yes. Um, but I just wanted to ask about the, um, you know, how, how, how you navigated that world, because, because we were, that was very challenging for us yeah. writing that. Yeah. How did you figure out that? How, you know, we, we, I remember having that conversation with you a number of times about the restrictions that we had. Yes. How did you navigate that? Yeah. So we um, basically working primarily with Sam Ricketts, who you know, um, who had been working on the Inslee campaign and had worked in the House of Representatives with then Representative Inslee. Uh, we started the summer before, so this is the summer of 2020, trying to figure out if we had the opportunity to pass a bill through budget reconciliation, how could we do a clean electricity standard through that uh, vehicle? And that was a 
question that nobody was really asking. And so we went around and we asked a lot of the experts uh, who worked in the Senate for decades in many cases. The amount of institutional knowledge is just amazing in the Senate. And we would interview them and we would ask them questions. And then we would also ask other groups, you know, what are some other priorities that we would want to have? And that really became that roadmap report that we published in February. Um, and then we did maintain a very open policymaking process. You know, over 60 groups attended our policymaking um, conversations and you know, uh, other groups were coming up with alternative designs for how to do this, like the Environmental Defense Fund, um, Resources for the Future, and Jesse Jenkins. And eventually, we all worked together to try to think about how we could actually uh, do this. And there was a lot of constraints, right? It had to be things that the utilities would agree to, uh, theoretically. And there was actually a lot of progress made on utilities uh, on that side of things. It had to be something that Senator Manchin would agree to. It theoretically had to be something that economists would agree to. Um, so it was a very difficult uh, road to walk at the end of the day. Um, and it's so true, everything you said, Kenneth, in terms of you know, the, the constraints of the process. So I'm writing a book, as I mentioned, where I'm doing a lot of research and talking to other people who were part of this process, and you and I will talk. And you know, one of the stories that I learned, actually, is that in that 10-day period between the bill showing up as a press release on Manchin's website and the final votes through the Votorama in the Senate on that Sunday, August 6th morning. There actually was one of these problems. I don't know if you were brought in on this or not, but basically a, a, the CBO put out a report like a day or two after the, um, the bill came out and it had like a footnote in one of the tables and the folks had been assuming in the Senate that there was like 10 to $11 billion from Superfund because the IRA also reinstates a Superfund tax and that that would be revenue. But the problem was it didn't go into the Superfund, it went into the general fund, exactly. And why, why, why do you care? Why am I telling you this weird story? Because that creates a reconciliation problem because basically it was going to theoretically implicate a um, committee in the Senate that did not have reconciliation instructions. Exactly. And you can't do that under the blah, blah, blah. Right. So there's these very arcane technical rules and the Republicans raised a challenge and it was a privilege challenge. And what a privilege challenge does is it can kill the entire bill. So like, oh, my God, really stressful. Right. And so thankfully, a bunch of brilliant people in the Senate who worked there forever went to the parliamentarian and they played their case and they said, no, 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 no. Well, this is not really a privilege challenge because blah, blah, blah. And thankfully, she said, OK, yeah, I'm going to strike that one down. But these were the these are the kinds of things that can happen literally at the 11th hour that could have just broken the entire bill apart. So between that and the Colorado River negotiation, I think the people who had to navigate that age like 20 years in a 10 day period, essentially. So yes, it, it's a really difficult process. And I think you know, it's easy from the outside to critique the work that I did or other people did as being not good enough, or why didn't you do that? Or why didn't you do this? And I certainly have received a lot of that on a personal level. But I think, you know, if you haven't tried it yourself, it's kind of easy to just sit around and criticize. Um, doing it is really, really, really hard. And we did try to have an open uh, policymaking process that included a lot of different folks in it. Um, and, you know, I think that we did as good as we could do under the circumstance. And thank, thank the Lord the bill did pass. So, yay. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, we have time for a very short question. Yeah, very oh, yeah. quickly. Last question. Um, so I have a question about international reactions to the IRA. IRA. Oh. Uh, the EU raised serious concerns about potential unfair competition, for example. Do you think that such ambitious uh, policies should include more uh, international coordination, or should we accept that it's more self-centered, regardless of international trade standards? And has it been brought up while crafting this, IR, uh, this act? Yes, I certainly, in the weeks and months after the law passed, had various meetings with folks from other countries where they would complain about how hard it was and why did we do such a thing. And I said, well, I hear you have some really ambitious targets over in Europe. Perhaps you should just do the same thing yourselves. Um, we don't really have a long time to waste here. Uh, you know, all of us are, are going to be on this planet in, you know, a decade, hopefully, and two decades, our children will certainly be on this planet. And I don't think it's a time to be complaining and griping. And I generally feel from a negotiation perspective, as I was trained by Larry Suskind, that it's a growing pie. 
that the pie is getting bigger. We don't have to feel a scarcity mindset in terms of, oh, you're building heat pumps over there, blah, blah, blah. You know how many heat pumps we have to build? You know how many EVs we have to build? I mean, look at the adoption curves. They're insane. Most people think 2035 is insane as a, as a clean electricity target, right? There is no scarcity here. We have so much we have to do, and every single country can have a very vibrant workforce doing this. So I just think it's a question of join in and not a question of scarcity. Okay, before we wrap up, let me note that we'll meet again in a week uh, here. Conley Byers, a Harvard Environmental Fellow, will be speaking about the challenges decarbonizing the grid, building in part on some of the conversation we've had here today. Finally, please join me in thanking Leah Stokes for her insights and presentation today. Thank you, Leah. <laughs>